Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad. Welcome to today's Bible study. And before we open up this session, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's put our heads and pray. Loving Father, we thank you. Yes. We yield to your presence, yes. your guidance, your wisdom. Yes. Speak your word in simplicity and clarity. Through us in power, yes, that it may change all that hear us yes. to the glory and the praise of your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So today, Nero. we begin another series. We begin with the book of Romans. And just to give you a brief on the book of Romans. The book of Romans is a systematic treatise that is considered the magnum opus of all Pauline episodes. It is the most comprehensive presentation of Christianity in the New Testament. Paul's letter to the Romans was written about half of the first century. It is believed between 56 and 58 AD. When he was situated in Corinth, on his third missionary journey. Now, contrary to what many people perceive, Paul did not found the church in Rome. So he was writing to a church he did not found. And Phoebe, whom we see in the 16th chapter, happened to be going to Rome. So Paul takes this opportunity to put together this comprehensive letter to the church in Rome. And what is found here is an amazing book that he put together. In this letter also, he wanted to announce the plans that he had to visit the church in Rome. This letter was written to a community that was largely gentle. Which brings the relevance to us today. Now, this is a letter that has influenced so many people throughout the ages. This is the letter that sparked one of the greatest revivals since the day of Pentecost. It is through this letter that Martin Luther Martin Luther came to the understanding of faith. And this rekindled the change that brought the greatest awakening the world has ever seen. Since the day of the apostles. It is also this very letter that John Bunyan John Bunyan, while in Bedford in jail, caught up the themes there, and he penned one of the greatest masterpieces, which is called The Pilgrim's Progress. Now, The Pilgrim's Progress is a book that has helped many Christians relate on how 
we walk in this world that is fallen. Chia ambi aba Kristo yobanji mungeri jokwe isamu munse no boku tambulia munse ni ya chama. It is also this very book. Era chitabo chino chechimu. That rekindled the embers of John Wesley. Checha kumomulido mu John Wesley. While reading what had been written by Martin Luther. Nga asome vya wa ndikibwa Martin Luther. And this warmed his heart. Era neguzo mutima gwe. To the greatest evangelical awakening. Of the 18th century. And as we go through this book, our prayer is that your heart will be stirred up. That you will be rekindled and set up on fire based on what this word can do in the lives of men. Can we go to the text? We will look at the first four verses of the chapter. So Romans chapter 1. From verse 1 to verse 4. Let's read. The Bible says Paul. Paulo. A born servant of Jesus Christ. Christo, called to be an apostle. Mutume, separated to the gospel of God which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Christo, wafe, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power. According to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead. Here we see several themes come through. First we see the introduction of the writer of the book. And Paul here identifies himself in three ways. He identifies himself number one by his rank. Then by his office. And thirdly by his mission. For his rank, he calls himself the slave or born servant of Jesus Christ. Concerning his office, he is called an apostle. And concerning his mission, he is separated to the gospel of God. Now, when we look at this introduction, what comes to the fore is that Paul takes a back seat and lets the role of spreading the gospel take the form seat. When he appraises himself or introduces himself to the church, he does not bring his Jewish name to the front. What he brings to the front is actually his Gentile name. Paul, Paul which means little. He doesn't bring to the front the name Saul which speaks to one of the kings of Israel. And it is believed this is the name that he changed to be able to facilitate his travels through the Roman Empire. Why would Paul not be proud of his Jewish heritage? Because the fact is he had a rich history. His family was a Pharisee family. So they were at the prime. 
They were very renowned. He had studied at the feet of Gamaliel. One of the eminent tutors of his time. So there was a lot to be proud about. Yet he did not consider that. And what we see him bringing us his introduction is just the name Paul. And there he brings forward describing who this Paul is. And he brings the description as follows. The first one, he calls himself a born servant of Jesus Christ. Now, born servant is the Greek word doulos. Now, doulos means a slave. It is a low and humble term. Of, it means he has been purchased. He is owned by someone. It was inconceivable for someone who was Roman who had picked on a Roman citizenship to then declare himself a slave. Because Romans prided in their freedom. Yet when Paul comes to the frontier and is introducing himself, he introduces himself as a born servant of Jesus Christ. I believe there is something that he knew that before salvation he was born a slave in sin through his physical birth and be came now a born slave of Christ through the second birth. Now the cords that had bound him to his old master had been broken. And now through the freedom that he enjoyed, he joins himself to his new master, the ne, Lord Jesus Christ, with cords that cannot be broken. In the same way with us, when we come to Jesus Christ, our willingness to serve him and obey him is what enables us to be useful to his service. That is what makes us usable servants in the kingdom. And that is what makes our work of significance eternally. No wonder Paul later writes Paul to the church to the Galatians in chapter 1 and verse 10 and he says for now do I persuade men or God or do I seek to please men for if I still please men I would not be a born servant of Christ. The point here is when we come to Christ he never calls us to be our own man. The autonomy goes away because he has a plan for every one of us. Yes, he has set us free. According to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. But it is our freedom in Christ now that allows us to sacrificially love him to the maximum and be willing to serve him. That mindset erodes the celebrity mindset that has captured so many servants of God today. We understand them that we are here not to do our will but to do the will of Christ Jesus. The second introduction Paul gives he calls himself an apostle 
He says called to be an apostle. Now the Greek word for called is the word kletos. And apostle is the word apostolos. Now to be is written in italics for many Bibles. Because it was added there for emphasis. But the original Greek does, does not have that. What is it that Paul wants here for us to get? He is calling to the apostolic office. It was not his invention. It is God that called him. It is God that initiated that. It is God that enlisted him. This carries the idea of somebody being an emissary of a king. Somebody carrying a message. Somebody commissioned to represent a, a king or somebody in authority. In our present day, it would be the word ambassador. Basically, what that meant to Paul is that he had a task to execute. He had an assignment here now. No wonder he comes to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16 and says, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. And he says, yes. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. You see, everyone who has come to Christ Jesus is an ambassador for him. So the call is for you to represent him. So we carry the message which is the gospel to the world. So God is summoning us with the credentials as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. The third description Paul gives, he says he separated the gospel of God. And the word separated here is the Greek word aphorizo. Now, aphorizo is two words. One is apple. And the other is hoizo. Apple simply means out of. Hoizo means to mark off by bounder. To limit. To have an to appoint an area of service. Basically, what is said here is Paul's calling that he wants us to understand and he wanted the Romans to understand had limits. It was not to everything. It was strictly to the gospel of God. And this gospel of God, he uses the word that we see in in Greek called Ejelion. Ejelion means good news. So basically what he was assigned to do, his scope of work was to the good news of Jesus Christ. And this separation that he talks of did not happen at his conversion. When he wrote his letter to the church in Galatia, this is what he says in chapter 1 and verse 15. He says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, here we see that his calling 
His separation was in his mother's womb. He was set apart for this one task. And when he found the purpose for which he was created, he comes back to us in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. And emphasizes that this one thing I do. He did not do many things. The one thing he decided to do was that for which he was separated to perform or execute. Now, what does that mean to us? Every one of us has a duty. And the duty is to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as a Christian who is separated to the gospel, it is a requirement that you isolate yourself from all other ruling aims and all other goals and use the energy and the resources to this one end of advancing the gospel. Paul then goes to verse 2. And he continues to say, which he promised before. Through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. What is he trying to say here? He's trying to say that there is nothing new. What, this gospel of God was not a new invention. It is something that God had begun way back and pronounced the same through the prophets. It is a message that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. See, the message of the gospel is not limited to the New Testament. It begins with the Old Testament. When man sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God made a promise to the serpent and said the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. He was speaking concerning the gospel down the road we see the prophets come. Isaiah came and pronounced that a child would be born. In Isaiah 9, pointing again to the Messiah. In Isaiah 53, he points to the way he will bring redemption to mankind. The message is that the gospel is not an afterthought. It is God's initial plan and he intended to execute it to the very detail. No wonder when Paul was speaking to the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 13 verse 32 he says and we declare to you the glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers God has from time immemorial been promising and even the Lord Jesus himself concerning his life went to quote the very scriptures as written for the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27 Luke when he met the disciples that were on their way to Emmaus and he speaks to them the Bible says and beginning with Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself you see when we look at the Old Testament we we don't look at it in isolation. We need to see it as 
that which conceals the message that is now revealed in the New Testament. The Old Testament reveals Jesus in promises, in types, and indirect prophecies. Now the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And now the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. So the New Testament contains the Old Testament. And the Old is in the New Testament now explained. So we need to take the word of God holistically because it is the word of God. And Paul then goes on to explain what it is that was written from the forefathers. He says concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Let's break down this sentence. He says concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, Christo. The word here that we are using for concerning is the word peri. Which from which we get the word perimeter. Basically what he's trying to say that that this gospel of God has a central message. It concerns Jesus Christ. But using Perry, it does not just concern Jesus Christ. But it surrounds him. So the message is about him. He is the very substance of the gospel. And when he begins to explain what this is all about. He says this Jesus Christ who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now the word born that is used here is the word genomai. Genomai simply means that Something comes out of that which was not there before. So he became something that he was not before. So this implies a transition from one state to another. So when he talks about Jesus being born of the seed of David according to the flesh, what comes to the front is this, is that the state he now assumed, he did not have before. And later when John writes to us, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, he brings clarity to what happened. And says, and the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only one begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. So this brings Jesus to us as fully human. 100% human. What is God intending to brought us to. So that when we are relating with Christ, we are relating with a person. And then we have the assurance that the work that he did 
is a work that he did on our behalf. Now that helps us understand and places Jesus Christ in a unique position. Because it places him as a hundred percent man. And then it places him as the son of God. So he becomes the mediator between men and God. Like later Paul reveals to us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And he emphasizes that there is one God. And one mediator between God and men. The man Jesus Christ. Then Paul here goes on to explain and says and declared to be the son of God with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. First of all, let's take a step back. Why did Jesus have to put on flesh? You see, when man sinned, Man could not redeem himself because he was dead in sin. So once you are dead, you can't do anything. So it had to take somebody living to redeem the dead. So since men were dead, it had to take God. Why? Because it had to take a perfect person to redeem the imperfect. And only God is perfect. But remember, in the price he had to pay was the price of death. God is eternal. So he can't die. So he had to put on flesh in order to die. And in dying, he would then redeem us through his blood. Let's go on. In, in verse 4 he said, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection of the dead. Let's break that down a bit. He says, and declared to be the son of God. And the word declared there is the word horizon. It is the word where we draw the word horizon. In essence, it is placing a mark. And what is happening here? Jesus, who was the Son of God eternally, now God declares him plainly to men as his son. You see, as man, Jesus became something he was not before. So God had to declare his deity during his earthly life. And there are so many thoughts that come through here. Because throughout his life, there is so much about him that declared that he is the Son of God. But the question we ask, what would be that greatest proof that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and the Savior of the world? We have so many pointers. Number one pointer that we could look at is the fulfillment of scriptures. There are so many scriptures that all point to a Messiah who he comes as God to redeem mankind. 
abantu. Even Jesus himself. Yes, ye. In John chapter 5 and verse 39. When we were having this dialogue with the Pharisees. He tells them, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you, find, you have eternal life. And he says, and they are they in which testify of me. Basically, what he was trying to point out is what we saw earlier in Luke chapter 24 when he met the disciples he goes back to the scriptures and he explains to them how these scriptures are now fulfilled in his life. So yes, we have the pointer from scriptures as evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. But there are other pointers that we could consider. The pointer of his remarkable birth his birth was a miraculous one but there is something even more miraculous which was his conception in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 when Mary was wondering concerning the message that was came to her by the angel the angel said to her when Mary asked how shall this be since I don't know any man. This was the response of the angel. He said the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One which is to be born is to be called the Son of God. Here God declares that that which will be born of Mary will have the identity of the Son of God. And it is not only that. We have another point of his extraordinary life. The life that he lived lends credence to the fact that he is the Son of God. It amazed everyone. It amazed his contemporaries that John writes to us in John chapter 1 and verse 14 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only one begotten of the Father full of grace and truth and Jesus was able to say yes, that whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. He still goes ahead and says, I and the Father are one. And that lays precedence to this fact that he is the Son of God. But is that the greatest proof? Let's consider his death. His death was an astonishing feat. And when we read through the scriptures, we are heard in awe at what happened at the cross. Yes, some people have argued that whatever Christians may say, Jesus did not die the most brutal and violent death that anyone has made. Perhaps that's true. But what is not in doubt is that no one has ever died whose death has had more significance than the death of Jesus Christ. At the cross of Calvary, a thief who hung on the cross next to him saw so Jesus dying and said to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. 
the centurion at the cross. A sober-minded Roman soldier. God watched as the darkness enveloped the earth at noon. And he watched as Jesus breathed his last. And an earthquake swept all over the earth. And whatever he saw drove him to this one conclusion. That is recorded for us in Mark chapter 15 and verse 39. He said, truly, this man is the son of God. His death and atoning sacrifice is evidence to us that he is the son of God. But there is more to that. When Paul preached to the intellectuals in Athens. In the record that we have in Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. In his submission, this is what he says. He says, God who made the world. And everything in it. Since he's the Lord of heaven and earth. Does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he washed through the hands of men as though he needed anything since he gives to all breath and all things and has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the earth and has determined their pre-appointed time and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grow for him and find him. Though he is not far away from each of us. And him we move and in him we have our being. As also some of the poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are his offspring, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like the gold or silver or stone. Something shaped by art and man's devising. He says, truly the times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in the righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. So what is the evidence that he has ordained him? This is what he gives us in verse 31. And he has given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. The evidence that he is the appointed one. The evidence that he is ordained is the resurrection from the dead. He comes back to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. And in Ukevokali declares that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Now you may say, well, Paul may have been sentimental about the resurrection. How about Peter? Look at what he says when he visits the house of Cornelia. In his message to the people gathered there. Acts chapter 10 from verse 36 to 39. The Bible says, this is what Paul says. 
Peter said, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, that he is the Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good healing all of them that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and, he adds, and we are his witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. I want you to see several things here. Peter is telling them that these things you all know, it was the news of the time. These were the events that dominated the news at that time. But now he drives the point home. And he says the one who hung on a tree in verse 40 he says him God raised on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but to witnesses chosen before by God. Even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sin. This reality was not lost on Peter. Because again on the day of Pentecost Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 tells us that it says men of Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God you have crucified and put to death. And he drives the point again. Whom God raised having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he poured out this which you now see and hear. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assured that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. And the Bible tells us when the Jews had that they were cut to the heart. Never, ne, and that the 3,000 Jewish people became followers of Jesus Christ. Christ. What is that sign? It is the sign of the resurrection. Now you may say his disciples were occupied with his resurrection. They, they just made a big deal out of it. 
But John chapter 2, when Jesus had driven out the money changers from the temple, and they asked for the sign of his authority, he says, show us what sign since you do these things, he says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And they said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And when you raise it up in three days, and John explains that he was not talking about the temple. The physical building was talking about his body. And when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, you may say, Possibly they did not understand. But look at his crucifixion. Matthew chapter 27. His critics, the Pharisees, went to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember why he was still with us. How this deceiver said that after three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples steal him away and say to the people that is risen from the dead. So the last deception was will be worse than the first. And after they had secured it, he rose from the dead. Why? Because God declared him to be the son of his son. In power, which is dunamis, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The Bible tells us he was declared number one with great power. This is what Jesus told the Pharisees in John chapter 10, verse 18 to 19. He says, therefore my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me but I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from the Father. What does it say here? It says, any man can lay down their lives. <clears throat> that is within their ability. But once that power has, that life has been laid down, there is no way you can take it up again. That is why many great men have died. It is possible to lay the, your life. The issue is taking it up again. Only Jesus Yes, was we are able to take it up again. You see, the world cannot argue <laughs> about, about taking, taking your life. <laughs> but it stands a test of time. If after you have laid it down, Jesus, after three days, like he had promised, he took up his life again. So we have a choice to believe what he said or to just ignore the facts that are before us. Paul writes the church in Ephesus concerning the resurrection. He talks about what exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power 
Waguru nyo oriyabo abovu yinza na basasa. And right and dominion. Nama yinoo. And every name that is named. Nabuli rinya yinoo. Not only in this age but also in the age to come. Simbule mbe guno na yeo jidja. And he has put all things under his feet. Yonna ya maliza abitade wa suwe kelebye. And given to be the head. Nama yinoo kubo mbe. Over all things to the church. Which is his body. The fullness of him who feels all in all. Let's not miss the practicals here. What he wants us to understand is that this resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is on display for all believers. So you and I that have believed on Jesus Christ don't have any excuses to make. Why? Because he tells us in Ephesians 3 and 20 that he's able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we think or ask according to the power that is at work within us. No wonder Paul Paulo, later says that his longing is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death if by enemy I may attain to the resurrection of the dead and the Bible secondly says that he was declared according to the spirit of holiness now some scholars have said no this is talking talking about his moral character. I don't believe this is what is being talked about here. I believe it's talking about the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity. Because the Holy Spirit was involved in every aspect of Jesus' earthly ministry. He was, as we've seen, involved in his conception. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. He came down on the day he was baptized in a form of a dove. He led him into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. He empowered him to perform the miracles. And this is what the Bible says in Hebrews. Chapter 9 and verse 14. It says through the eternal spirit he offered himself without spot to God as our sacrifice on the cross. And the Bible then tells us that if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So if you don't understand what we are talking about here, it begins with giving your life to Jesus Christ and making him the Savior and the Lord of your life. If you have not done that, God has declared him as his son. God has declared him as the redeemer. Why don't you say this prayer with me? And surrender your life. And let the son of God take over it. And change you forever. Let's pray. Say dear Lord Jesus. I believe. You are the savior of the world. And I am a sinner. Who needs a savior? I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again on the cross. Lord Jesus, come into my life and surrender everything to you. Save me. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you say that prayer from the bottom of your heart, you have been wonderful. The message we have for you today, behold the Son of God. For you who is saved, behold the Son of God. 
But more so, take this message of the Son of God to the utmost parts of the land. So that everyone will behold him. For God has declared as his son through two things. Number one, the spirit of holiness. Number two, by power. And by resurrecting from the dead. And that, and that power is available every believer in Jesus Christ. So, from Dominion Church, it's been a pleasure having you as we meditate on this truth. May God minister to you and you find your place and do what you need to do. So till we meet again, say shalom. God bless you.